Give another minute or two for folks to join us. All right, let's get started. Good afternoon. I hope that you're doing well. I know this is only our second time meeting in class because of all the winter closures and stuff, but we are at a good point in the quarter um, where we've been able to catch up on a lot of things last week. And I'll use today to both recap some of the things that we went over on our first day and also an opportunity to get into some of the new things that we'll be discussing for this week. So uh, for this week, we're really trying to look at what it means to be a part of a group. As a member, how do people within a group communicate? And more specifically, we'll be looking today at the way that different groups have certain norms and expectations behind them. That's really useful for us to understand what it means to be a part of a good group, especially since uh, last class, people brought up things that they enjoyed working in groups, synergy, feeling like you're able to collaborate, but also some of the challenges, right? Issues related to feeling like not everybody is pulling their weight uh, or on the same page. So for this class, uh, starting this week, I will be doing uh, formal attendance for class. Um, remember that I always record classes, so you're welcome to watch the recording for days that you miss or to join us through Zoom, as folks did last week. Um, so the way that I do this is I'll typically give you some type of individual prompt or maybe a group activity or something similar that you can turn in for attendance credit for the day. If you use a device such as a laptop, you're welcome to type it up and email it to me at the end of class. Alternatively, um, you can also uh, write it down physically and hand it in to me at the end of class with your name too. Either way, uh, it's just a way to uh, get you thinking about some of the ideas of the class. So last week, as a prompt, I asked you to think about some of the small groups uh, that you might be a member of. So for today, I'd like you to pick a small group that you're currently a part of, or maybe that you've been a part of in the past, um, and then write down the name of that group. And then I'd like you just to take a few minutes to brainstorm and think about the ways that uh, members of that group communicate. For instance, you might think about some of the channels that they use to communicate, such as Skype, Group text I had some folks in my last class mention that their group communicates through Snapchat. Some of the specific language or jargon that your group uses. One way to think about jargon, right, is that it's language that an outsider, person not a part of your group, would not be familiar with or understand. You could also think about the roles that certain members of your group play. For instance, you have a team captain, you have a president or a leader of the group, or is it a more kind of democratic form? Uh, group membership. And then what are some of the do's and don'ts of your group? For instance, their rules, um, what would be considered acceptable or unacceptable to be a member of that group? So I'll give you some time to work on that on your own as a prompt. Um, and then um, I'll ask you to hang on to it because we'll be doing more with this a little bit. Give you an example, right? One group that I was involved in in the past is speech and debate. Um, some of the things that we did, um, including channels, roles, and so on, right? If we were driving to a tournament, right, we'd have the person who was riding shotgun with us be the DJ and play music that they liked as a way of getting to know each other. 
but be an example of a role that you can play. Take you a couple of minutes on this. Thank you. 
Go ahead and wrap up your currently Friday or work here. So hang on to this for now. Again, I'll ask you to refer to it in just a little bit. But again, I like to use little activities like this as a way of getting us thinking about some of the ideas from the class. So we'll get into some things for today, including some reminders, updates, and things to know. But before we do that, I know that there's a couple people that are here for the first time today. Um, so I'd like to see if there's anybody that's here for the first time. And for those of you that are here for the first time, I'd love for you to do a short introduction. Um, tell us who you are, where home is for you. It's something interesting, maybe not so interesting to happen to you over the break. Uh, so who all is new here today? Yes, feel free to introduce yourself. So, hello everyone, my name is Andrew and I'm from the Republic of Palau. And I'm a transfer student and so I'm a sophomore. And nothing is really interesting for me in the past summer, except like traveling. So, yeah, that's just it. Yeah, uh, thank you, Andrew. Uh, where, where all did you travel? I traveled all the way from Palau, so I went from Palau, and then I came to Guam, Hawaii, San Francisco. Awesome. Uh, that's great. <laughs> uh, very dramatic. That's and everything. Yeah, well, welcome, Andrew. Glad to have you here. Who else is here for the first time today? Yeah, JP. Hello, my name is JP. I am from Fairness, Oregon, and uh, I had a very chill winter break. I didn't do a whole lot. So. Yeah, um, I know there's a lot of folks in classes that have had like flight cancellations and other things happen and didn't end up doing a whole lot. So, okay. Is that everybody? Or yes? Uh, I'm Devin Ingram. Uh, I'm from Grand, but I just transferred here. This is my first term at UAE. I was at LIT last term. Uh, I transferred here my first day at UAE. Oh, wow. So this is your first day here, you said? Yeah. That was oh, semester. yeah. Well, uh, welcome. We're glad to have you here. Thanks for thanks for joining us here at EOU. I've had a couple other students who are like in their very first term here. So you're definitely not alone in joining us. So um, glad to have you. Awesome. So uh, did I get everybody or is there anyone else here? For the first time? That's all right. Great. Uh, so if you're new today, um, remember that you are always welcome to uh, see recordings from previous classes. So I upload to camp, them to Canvas right after class ends. Um, so we didn't take formal attendance last week. We are starting this week, but it's an opportunity if you need to catch up. You're also welcome to get in touch with me if you're falling behind or you just would like some additional help with catching up. But um, this is only our second class meeting, given the winter closures and all that stuff. So. Glad to have you here. Before we get into some of the new stuff for today, I just wanted to do some housekeeping and reminders. So the first thing is that we have um, the first quiz, right? So all the quizzes in the class are open note, open book, and they're taken on campus. Um, so that first quiz was going to be due on Sunday, but because of the winter closures, I extended it, and it's due at the end of the day this Wednesday. So please make sure that you complete it by Wednesday, January 12th. Again, that covers the week one reading that's available on Canvas, as well as the syllabus. You can have those open, such as using different tabs, working through those. And then everything else from here on out, including the quizzes, are due on Sundays. So um, that gives you the full work, week to work through those. Again, uh, the recording and slides are available. So if you're not able to join us face-to-face, -face, you can join us through Zoom. And if you can't join us through Zoom, um, then you can complete the makeup assignment for credit for that day. So um, just as a reminder slash refresher for people who are here for the first time, um, if you go to our Canvas page for the course, you'll notice that I just did a short video for the first day that you went over a couple things related to class. Um, after class, I'll post the video. Uh, shortly before class starts, I'll post the slides for that day. That way, for those of you that use the device, you're welcome to have that slide uh, set open as you're working through the class. 
Um, so don't feel like you need to get things down word for word as we're working through this. The readings for that week will be posted. Again, there's no textbook purchase for this class. All the readings are free. Um, and then that's where you'll complete the quiz. So again, I just have this main page divided up by week. If you missed a class and need to complete the makeup assignment, you can do that there. Um, if you need to access the syllabus, in other words, the instruction manual for the class, that's right here. Um, and you can click here if you need to access the class through Zoom. I have my office hours. Again, I'll be there face to face, just upstairs in Ackerman. Uh, but if you can't meet with me uh, face to face, you can also join here, and I will also at the same time be available on Zoom. So, again, uh, that's just my availability and stuff to know uh, going into the class. Make sure that you are reviewing this syllabus as well as this. Uh, first week reading uh, going into the books. So that's uh, major kind of housekeeping and course related updates. Does anybody have any questions about anything related to the class at this point? Let me go ahead and share. So last class, we did a kind of crash course introduction um, and also introduced some of the ideas and perspectives on small group communication. I'm going to do a couple reviews of some of the things that we went over since I know we covered a lot of ground and had to work through the last couple of things kind of quickly. We also were looking at you know, why small group communication matters and is important to our lives. Whether we like it or not, we're all gonna have to work in a group at, in at least one point in our lives and developing and building those skills, right? And help us to feel like a positive experience. That at its best, small group communication is more than the sum of its parts. People can brainstorm and come up with ideas, and do things really effectively together. Uh, but at its worst, right, people don't pull their weight, it can feel like a big source of stress and so on. One thing I want to emphasize again for this class is that while there'll be group activities and so on that you'll be doing, at the end of the day, your grades and so on will be individual. So there's no like sink or swim together. Um, your grade on an assignment is based on uh, group uh, overall or anything like that. So again, uh, we're in groups, right? Uh, as I mentioned last class, if you think about it, the bigger a group gets, the more possible permutations and combinations of people there are, right? You have three people. A talks to B, B talks to C, C talks to A, A and B talk to C, C and A talk to B. You start to get a bunch of different combinations and situations in which people communicate. It just gets bigger and bigger and bigger, right? So if you've ever been in something like a group, like a sports team or extracurricular or activity, and you're curious as to all those dynamics and the ways that those play out. That's something that we'll be looking at. We can feel better and uh, more effective as we're working in a group too, through studying and understanding what small group communication is, right? Doing something well and understanding it uh, are really connected. And it also helps us think about the ways that things like culture, identity, language, and so on can connect for communication. So um, small group communication, as I mentioned last class, has four major stages. First one is a forming stage. So last class, I had us do a little activity where for 10 minutes you were in small groups and you were trying to find things in common that everybody in that group shared, right? You were in that forming stage where you were doing basic things like getting each other's names and learning super basic information about each other. We're also in the storming stage, right? So there was one of the groups um, that was really interested in like this or that style questions, cats or dogs, uh, pineapple on pizza, yes or no, right? Uh, that early stage is an opportunity to work out your differences and figure out where all of you are coming from. The performing stage is doing the thing, right? So I asked each group to share some of the things that stood out to them as similarities among their group. And then adjourning, right, was after that activity where the group wrapped up. So small groups are created and destroyed and changed 
a lot over time. That's something we went over last class. And we also talked about how your own membership and participation within a group can develop and change too, right? If you're a potential member, maybe you're thinking about transferring to EOU or your prospective student who is deciding where to go to college, EOU is on the mind, right? You go from being a potential member to like a new person, right? Maybe you're a transfer student or a new member of the group. You become a full member where you understand the ins and outs and rules, you're trusted. And then you might start to leave the group. You focus on a divergence or separation out from the group. You become a marginal member where you're no longer actively involved. And then you might be an ex member where you leave the group. For instance, again, if you're involved in some type of activity or club in high school, Maybe you left that as a senior and had that transition process as you started to focus on the next stage of your life. So that group membership can definitely change over time. So those were some of the things that we went over last class, right? That us as members of a group can change over time and that the group itself evolves and changes. It's never the static thing. Even if you're a part of a club or activity that's existed for years and years, its members and its overall team dynamics have changed a lot, right? Uh, oftentimes you might hear stories of previous iterations or uh, situations in which your group or activity was happening. For instance, uh, graduating seniors that were involved in an athletic team that you did for. So for this class, we're gonna talk a little bit more about group norms, right? Because our communication is very much shaped by boundaries. Uh, how we choose to communicate with other people is really impacted by the norms and beliefs that we as members of a group might have. So if you've ever seen uh, Avengers, including Infinity War, right? There's a scene where the Avengers go to Wakanda, right? And T'Challa, Black Panther, um, is there, right? Uh, there's a scene where I think it's Captain America, Thor, uh, tries to bow to him, right? And T'Challa says, we don't do that here. It's a meme, it's pretty silly, but it is an interesting way of thinking about group norms and behavior, right? Um, the idea, you're not supposed to bow because that's not what you do. It's not an acceptable practice of nonverbal communication, ties to the idea of norms in a small group, right? Norms are some of the things that you started to brainstorm and write down at the beginning of class today. They're the do's and don'ts, the rules or guidelines that members of a group are supposed to follow. They reflect expectations, right? That is, what are you supposed to do or expected to do as a member of this group? For instance, if you're involved in an athletic group, you might be asked to ask to regular uh, tests for COVID, right? That could be an expectation of the group. And it's about how you can act both individually as well as interact or engage with other people. So these kinds of norms shape both your own behavior as well as the behavior and communication that happens with other people. So there's a lot of different reasons, right, that we have group norms. If you think about communication, going back to last week, communication is about the use of symbols to convey information. We use all sorts of symbols, whether it's an eye roll, whether it's a photo, whether it's a text or written message, or whether it's face-to-face -face communication. And our language is how that meaning happens. If we didn't have uh, explained clear words, then we wouldn't be able to communicate at all. If I were to say dog, there's a dog over there, and a dog could mean anything. A dog could be a chair, a dog could be a giraffe, a dog could be uh, a table, right? And I said, look, there's a dog. You wouldn't know what I was talking about, right? Because our words limit us um, and define what it is that we're talking about, we're able to use those to convey meaning to other people. In other words, another example, right? If I were to say, well, I'm drafting, right? Or I'm going to drafting for Maybe that means that you're part of an architecture group of students or school or something similar, right? Drafting does not mean in this context, the military. Um, so to say I'm going to drafting school means I'm working on architecture. And you know that because you understand the context and applicability of that work. In the same way, being a member of a group means that there's shared understanding 
about what words mean and how words are used within that group. For instance, perhaps at a church or religious organization that you're a part of, right, there are regulations surrounding the kind of language that's appropriate to use, including the use of what might be considered to be vulgar language, right? Uh, that constrains and defines communication of your group. So those boundaries are important in terms of defining who is in the group and how that group communicates, and also that it resolves uncertainty or ambigu ambiguity about how people communicate. Again, if you know drafting means architecture, and not the military, uh, or getting a draft card, then you understand what members of that group are saying. So group norms help us to understand and relate to one another. They let us speak the same language and understand each other. Otherwise, our words don't mean anything. So the norms that we have as members of a group, right, can be both explicit and implicit. And they can impact us either individually or in the group of the whole, right? So an explicit individual norm is something that's written, that's clear, and it's something that you need to do for yourself, right? So for instance, um, if you've accepted student loans, right, you've had to sign off on a form, or if you're a member of a club or activity, you probably had to sign a handbook or a form that um, agrees to some procedures or behaviors that you will do as a member of that group, right? An explicit rule that you might follow in the whole group would be doing something like keeping minutes. If you're a member of a group that makes major decisions or has some level of disagreement, I highly, highly, highly recommend that you either record the meeting or that you take minutes after the meeting, right? Taking minutes is a way to track what it is that happened over the course of the meeting. And one way that this is often used is that in the next meeting, uh, the, meeting uh, the meeting minutes are voted and approved on. Meeting minutes are really helpful to avoid he said, she said situations, right? If people have a meeting and then they disagree about what was said or what happened during that meeting, it can be really hard to trace and figure out what did happen unless those meeting minutes are made. So that can be a really great explicit group norm uh, that minutes are taken as a way to track what was said. An implicit norm, right? Implicit means that it's not directly stated, it's implied or it's suggested. In this case, the idea that a person should raise their hand if they are supposed to speak might be an implicit norm, right? As another example, in K through 12, oftentimes you need to raise your hand and ask to use the restroom. Now that you're in college, right, you don't need to do that. You can just get up and use the restroom if you need to. That's a change in implicit norms that we've seen over time. And then an implicit norm that impacts the whole group. That could be something like um, somebody agreeing that every week donuts will be brought into the group. So it's not something that everybody has to do. Uh, or is written or hard coded, it's just something that members of the group have developed over time. Again, uh, our speech and debate team, everybody who wrote Shotgun got to be a DJ and play their own music. Nobody said they had to do that, but it became a tradition and was passed down through that group as a thing that we would do. So, in addition to whether or not a norm in a group is explicit or implicit, Right? There's a lot of other categories that we can use to understand uh, what norms are and how norms impact the way that we communicate within our group. So I'm going to kind of walk through each of these, and then I'll ask you to apply and use some of these norms on your own. So an interaction right, is shaping the ways that members of the group choose to interact or communicate with one another. One really obvious example is that in this class, we're all wearing masks, right? We're required to do so uh, by the state of Oregon and by EOU, and it impacts how we communicate with one another. Another example of an interaction norm, um, in some types of formal meetings, there's what's known as stacking, where instead of people speaking freely, somebody raises their hand and they get added on to a list. And so people go down the list. Um, if you raise your hand upward, right, you're adding yourself to the list. If you're raising your head down, downward, you're doing like a downward motion, then you're responding to a point somebody makes. 
that might be one way to regulate interaction by requiring people to formally raise their hands or be added to a list of people speaking. Another norm, right, is uh, procedure oriented norms, right? So if you were to use something like a calendar and slot in, like a uh, meeting for an hour, right? That would be a procedure oriented norm. Everybody's going to gather on Zoom for one hour to discuss or deal with this issue. So this is how the group works and what it is that the group do. So maybe they meet on Zoom, maybe they have a regular meeting once a week, or maybe they're less formal and they only meet at certain times when they feel like they all want to get together. For instance, if you're a part of the band, right? And the band chooses to, to have a random less defined time to meet and work together. Status norm, right? So um, one example, right, is associate students of EOU or ASEOU, right? This is an organization that works together with uh, the administration on a lot of important issues that impact students. So <clears throat> ASEOU would have status norms, right? They would have uh, some level of influence uh, that affects the overall communication. As another example, if you're a member of an athletic team or sport, right, you might have a team captain or co captain. This is somebody that has a level of status or influence over the group, and that leadership is going to impact how the communication happens. When we go into a group, not everybody is in the exact same space as far as power goes. So you might have somebody who's a leader, who's a director, who's a supervisor. And so that status is going to impact how uh, the group member communicates. You might be looking to the supervisor or leader or captain to make a lot of key decisions and guide the discussion in a way that you might not otherwise. And then lastly, achievement norms. You can think about achievement norms as what is your group going to do when it's over? What should your group produce or put together? For example, last week, I asked you to put together a list of the things that your group members shared in common. So depending on the group, you might have some pretty serious expectations. You've got to get through like a ton of papers and produce a lot of work over a short period of time. Or maybe the achievement norms are not as specific. Maybe you're a band getting together and just making some new music. <coughs> so what I'd like you to do now is to find a partner or a group of three. And I'd like you to look into uh, some of the ways that your group that you chose at the beginning of class communicates. So for instance, um, you might work with your partner to talk through some of the things that you wrote down. And I'd like you to identify and work with your partner, group of three, about to what degree the things you wrote down are explicit or implicit, and then how you might categorize some of the group norms that you wrote down. For instance, maybe the way that your group communicates using text or uh, Snapchat right, could fit under an implicit norm and might be interaction. So I want you to work with a partner or group of three to start to brainstorm and figure out how you would categorize or sort uh, the ways that your group communicates. We'll give you some time to work on. Yeah. Um, um, 
Sounds like most folks are wrapping up. So uh, what I'd like us to do is uh, go around and since we're still getting to know each other, uh, remind us of your name. And then I'd like you to share a couple of the norms that you wrote about and you were able to categorize. So for instance, uh, you know, maybe there was an implicit norm that really stood out to you or a uh, procedural oriented norm that you realized matched up with what you're so uh, why don't we go ahead and start up here on the side. I'm Gavin, and one of the norms 
for my friend group was we all just talk over like Discord and Snapchat. So uh -huh. that would be like an interaction norm. Uh -huh. I think that's how this would be. Yeah, yeah. The way that you would communicate, have interaction through that medium, absolutely. It's gotten a lot more popular, right, as a way to casually communicate. Uh, so yeah, that would definitely fit. Okay, so for my small group, I did the wrestling team uh -huh. and interaction norms. We kind of communicate through WhatsApp, text, email, mm -hmm. and like procedure wise, our coach had like inputted all our events and things like that into Google Calendar. So we have mm -hmm. that. And we also received um, like a text of like our week plan. Yeah. Great. Thanks for sharing. Yeah, having like a coach or somebody that directs a lot of that interaction for you, right, shows a role of status in norms, but also can help just direct the communication too. Let's move to the second row here. Yeah. 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 I like I like that like practice is a form of casual communication, getting to know each other. A lot of the day-to-day -day tasks, right, are a lot of the ways that our relationships people. Yeah. Thanks for sharing. I'm the same. I did frame, I did friend group as well. And right now, actually, it's just talk a lot of like Discord and Snapchat. And that's that's how we interact all the time. It's like basically our norm is that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's interesting to trace how like a different form of social media communication, doing something like Snapchat, right, where the photos are going to vanish after a while, um, can really help shape the interactions too. Right, it can maybe make you feel more secure knowing that the message is going to be gone. Um, but it can also raise some anxiety, right? What did I get from this person? Um, and not being able to follow it for, uh, or keep it in an archive of the same time. So how we use social media can definitely shape how groups communicate for sure. Um, Devin, uh, I did my friend group, so interactions is mostly like, to me, the kind of Snapchat would not, uh, you know, great to use. There's no really procedure for the friend group. Uh, mm -hmm. Status, not much. Uh, the code takes control of the plans for the flow of the bus. Mm -hmm. yeah, but yeah, it's not so much. Sure. Yeah. And I mean, a lot of times, right, it might not have very many of those explicit tools either. Um, my name is Gabe, and I'm on the track team as well. So they're pretty much the same uh, for meeting up practices and learning ways. Um, and then for procedure, just kind of saying, uh, if you want to get into depth in the practice, we usually warm up and stretch, and then we get into our events. Mm -hmm. And then status, there's uh, coaches, and we do have athletic trainers too, and there's uh, upperclassmen. And then for achievements, it's also like how you do, and then how the team does. Mm -hmm. So there's like so many different parts to go into that, right? Like not only that you're a member of the team, but also that like there's alumni, coaches, and other people that are actively working toward those schools too. A lot of different roles, uh, levels of status, and so on that are coming together. Um, I'm Kenna, and I'm also on the track team. And um, I'm I'm sure like an implicit rule, I think, that applies to us. It's like when we're, uh, well, we're both throwers, but when we're throwing, we follow like an order. Like, throwing, like somebody starts and then we go in the same order every time we go around. Uh -huh. Yeah, so something like an order um, is just something that maybe isn't hard coded, but you just know that you're going to do pretty consistently. It's a really good example. Let's go up here on this side. So let's start in the front. Andrew. So I did not, there's like a little bit of both, extra bit and extra bit. Uh -huh. And um, for the interaction, more. like we usually meet in person in our department. But other than that, we meet through, uh, we communicate through emails, texts, and our, like a group chat. And then for the procedure norms, 
Uh, we should wait for our president to like decide whether to do this event on the, a perfect day. But other than that, we also have a calendar, like a Google calendar to like meet us through. And for the status norm, we have the president, the vice president, secretary, and treasurer. And then for the achievement uh, norms, usually when we have an event that are successful, we look forward to the next event and like plan ahead of time. Yeah. Thanks so much for sharing. You did a great job of going through this, right? And uh, I like the way that you brought up some of the different roles, you know, like vice president, president, treasurer, and so on. And also some of the goals, like the, you know, achievements that you hope to have in preparation for the next event. Really good example of putting these in action. Okay. Oh, uh, my name's Brooke, and um, I'm part of the Women's at Dora program. And uh -huh. um, so, for interaction norms, um, we usually get like a text and a or an email about an event. And if you have time, then you and the time to go, then you can go. Or um, and so, for procedure oriented uh, norms, the leader usually schedules something if you. Want to attend? You can attend. Okay. Yeah. Thanks for sharing. Again, having that scheduling and planning uh, as part of the group storm can really help a lot. Would be here the second round. Uh, my name is Olivia. Uh, I did. I'm on the women's basketball team here, and so I did an explicit one, which would be like after the game, you don't mind how your shoes and take off any of your gear until the coach comes in and talks to us, and then we like break up and then get off. Yeah. That's a great example, right? Somebody that has not been a part of that team or group who just starts putting their shoes on and doing that stuff without knowing that they're not supposed to, right? Would definitely feel lost there. A lot of those norms are just things that you do on autopilot without thinking about it, but that an outsider would know. Yeah. Um, my name's Josie, and I was part of the Lunch of Sarkozy for all four years. And I just put like an achievement norm because the goal is to win throughout the season and then like at the end of the season you win the state and it's just a comfortable yeah and there's like a combination of the short and long-term goals there right where you're working for you know a particular meet or competition but then the broader uh goals too and so we might think about how leadership and our group communication style fits in the context of what my name's Alina and I chose the women's wrestling team. I'm also on the wrestling team. And um, for achievement norms, we all have the same goal and workouts to put the most effort that we can um, so that we can make each other better. And then for procedure oriented norms, um, we all make sure that we're in communication with wearing the same gear when we travel to the duels and tournaments so that we don't look non uniform. <laughs> Right, right. Having something like uniform dress code. So my partner comes from a really big family and every year they have like a color theme. And we always have to make sure we're dressed up in the right color for the photo, right? There's a lot of situations like that where uh, preparing and presenting yourself in the way that fits with the group is important. Let's move to the back here. Right. Uh, I'm Ryan and I'm an RA at Play School. So we used to uh, like interact with ones. Mm -hmm. Although I feel like it's going to fit to all the more, I feel like interacting with residents is, uh, is kind of the basis for everything else that we do. Mm -hmm. uh, just to go to front of the communication, to like finding stuff in the hall, attending events, all of that, just like that interaction. So. Yeah, I really, uh, it's an example of how and we'll talk more about this that if you have that status role, like you're an RA, right? Your communication has to be a little bit different than some of the residents. You have some level of power or influence and it's a question of how you're interacting with other residents based on that right uh, it definitely raise some challenges and opportunities um, we went over the same one together but because i'm also an RA, but uh probably for procedure oriented norms would probably be like um, how we schedule like our meetings and because like even starting the year we have to have like a meeting with every single floor like mm -hmm. in our hallway we have to have like a meeting with like a big staff, a smaller staff, just like on the like, Google Calendar. Everything. Yeah, yeah. Again, figuring out when and how to meet can oftentimes be its own like conversation in group meeting. So thanks for bringing that up. Yeah. Um, my name is Jay, and I'm part of the Shield program. So throughout the 
Yeah, having things like classes and regular meetings like that can definitely play a pretty good role. Uh, right, I'm part of the parallel, which is the last group here. Um, some interactions that for interaction norms is to go through group text and or email because the director, the director is not part of the group text, so it's an email that reports the stuff. Another interaction is like how to use uh, music terminology, or yeah, chords, um, progressions, and stuff like that. Um, some procedures is we show up to rehearsal, do practice, um, for, for also interactions, we also set up for. Um, sectionals in the group text for jam sessions where we just hang out and play. Uh, for status, of course, we have a director, we have our sax section, trombones, drums, etc. And achievements are also like the concerts or yeah. how will we perform our recording. Yeah, thanks for sharing. Again, a really good job working through and kind of talking through the way that things like targeted and specific language can impact the communication through the entire process. So thanks all for sharing. A couple of things that stood out to me, right, were some of the ways that you all talked about communication, such as, again, using Snapchat, Discord, having regular formal meetings, or perhaps informal meetings, right? Uh, the medium is the message, or at the very least, the way that we communicate plays a really big role in how that communication plays out. Um, and also the way that things such as status and leadership impact that process. So we'll continue to point at some of these things and start to think about some of these steps and norms as a way to help you for your first assignment in class that I'll be talking a bit more about. So to wrap up, we talked about the norms involved in small group communication, um, the ways that they affect how the group communicates with one another, and the ways that we can divide up based on procedure, uh, goals, and so on. Next class, we'll build on this a little bit more to talk more about things such as status, trust, and so on, and the ways that they can impact your group. So go ahead, and if you did your written attendance, please pass that forward. Uh, if you did it through uh, your device, please email that to me. And have a great Monday. I look forward to seeing you.